Well, I trust you had a great uh, Thanksgiving. I talked to one family this morning who was away skiing on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, but whatever your Thanksgiving entailed, I hope it was great. I think it's fair for us to just recognize the fact that for some folks, this time of year is very difficult due to whatever reasons, a host of reasons. And so it's incumbent upon us to be uh, praying for those of you that might be struggling. We do as a staff. Uh, we pray for those who, who, for whom this time of year is very difficult. Uh, beyond that, we do have ministries available uh, to give care in these particular areas. And I also want to just let you know that we're available pastorally, too, if you need uh, some face time, a coffee or a lunch or whatever, to just uh, be prayed with and, and have someone to, to talk to you. So uh, recognize that this morning. And at the same time, we're very excited that it's the first Sunday of Advent and, and what God is doing in our midst and will do. Um, last Sunday, a week ago, I tuned in to a little bit of the American Music Awards. Now, some of you may have seen some of my social media posts, and I watched some of the snippets and, and clips of the show flipping back and forth, and I came away with two conclusions. Number one, our society is slipping ever deeper uh, morally, and what is now morally and socially acceptable in terms of performance uh, is very different than, say, even 15 or 20 years ago. And number two, it was really evident, and I don't believe it was coincidence, based on the fact that today we were talking about the four women of Advent, that the American Music Awards and much of pop culture is being carried along by strong women. And these are women who are smart, talented, confident, attractive, and who use their femininity for the advancement of self, be it career, uh, prowess, certainly money, fame, whatever it might be. Now, coming from a man's world, uh, society largely admires them, lauds them, and probably is not a stretch to say, in many cases, even worships them. Um, and, you know, from a human standpoint, I get it. They, like you and me, are longing to be loved, to be affirmed, and to find both purpose and meaning in this life uh, on this planet. And they're accomplishing that, albeit it's only a shadow of what God would have for them and desire for them in submission of these very same qualities to the Lordship of Jesus. So that sort of got my mind thinking around this question. If you picked sort of the four uh, women who really kind of uh, drove that particular broadcast last week, J-Lo, Nicki Minaj, Ariana Grande, and, and Demi Lovato, as pillars of pop culture, if you will, how do these women stack up against the women of the Bible? or more specifically, the four women of, of Matthew's genealogy of Jesus here. By the way, that's Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. How do they stack up? Or, or in other words, are, they, are, are the women of the Bible that we'll look at this morning so far off from what we see in our culture? And, and I think the answer is both yes and no. But the big point here this morning is I think we have sanitized our view of both the Advent players the Bible stories in general, and probably even romanticized it. We, we remove the vulgar el elements from our understanding. Well, as we look at the four women of Advent this morning, we're unable to do that. We're unable to do that. These women, we assume, would never behave like some of the leading women of our time, and we want to challenge that a little bit, look openly at, and honestly at that. Now, Ruth is sort of the exception. She's the noblest of the four. But they're the illegitimacy of these four women in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus to be in the family line of Jesus, to be a part of God's chosen people, is part of the big point Matthew wants to make. It's God's grace that is why that they, they are there. Uh, consequently, who might God call out of pop culture, what male or female, to do great work for him that we might deem disqualified because of behavior we currently witness. Who knows? Who knows how God will work? So this morning, as I've alluded to, we're looking at the four women of Advent. The next three weeks, we'll look at other fours, if you will, the four men of Advent, and uh, Andy will help us with that next week. And then Brandon Barnes will come and, and talk to us about the four places of Advent. And finally, Bob will give us the four responses as he draws uh, those three weeks to a conclusion. I've not put the responses up there. Um, I think I don't want to steal Bob's thunder and, and um, allow him to sort of to share with us what, uh, what conclusions he comes to. 
So we are going to begin this morning where the birth of Christ will eventually take us as Jesus goes to the cross, and that is God's grace. And remember that grace is undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor of God. So let's look at Matthew chapter 1. We'll read the first 17 verses. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. <clears throat> Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa, and Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. Abiud was the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Let's pray this morning as we begin to look at this chapter. Our God and Father, we uh, look at this particular chapter of the Bible and perhaps struggle a little bit to understand how will we draw application for 21st century life in America from a list of names, a list of those who were born to these women in particular. Lord, we would ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to do exactly that. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this, this morning, at first, we're going to look in a little bit of detail at this genealogy, compare and contrast a little bit with Luke's, and then as quickly as we can, we'll get to these women and ask, what application can we draw for our lives today, and again, in 21st century America? But Matthew's genealogy here serves as a proof text of Jesus' right to the throne, his kingship. In fact, if you've been here at all over the course of the fall, we're studying the Gospel of Matthew. We're coming to Matthew 19. The theme of Matthew is Jesus is King. Well, now we're jumping back to the beginning in the spirit of Advent here, and we're looking at this genealogy. It's really important that we understand that this is a genealogy and not a chronology. A chronology would give us the exact names and the exact order of every uh, ancestor of, of the person that it was the genealogy of. Matthew here and other genealogies in the Bible have a, it, it, the genealogy is a means to an end. It's driving to a point. Now, in fact, there are four major points, at least in, in terms of what, what uh, Matthew wants to accomplish in this genealogy. We'll look at two of them. But Matthew's genealogy and genealogies in the Bible in general will occasionally skip generations to make it an uh, even number, will highlight certain relatives over others to make a point, and all of that is driving to where the author is helping us, what he's wanting us to understand. And that's definitely the case here. We'll look at an example of that as well. But what about Matthew's genealogy as compared to Luke's in Luke chapter 3? They're different. Essentially, Matthew is concerned, again, with showing that Jesus is king. And so he shows the heirs to the throne of David and makes mention of the fact that Jesus is the rightful Messiah, the rightful king of Israel. Luke is concerned with the physical messiahship of Jesus, who Jesus' uh, literal uh, ancestors were through the line of Joseph. And that is Mary marries Joseph, she then comes into his bloodline. Uh, the other thing that's really fascinating here is that Matthew says that Jesus is the son of David and the son of Abraham, Abraham in, in verse 1, and then expounds on that. 
And this is really critical because the son of David, as we've already said, is the rightful heir to the throne. He is the promised deliverer. He is the, the anointed one, the Messiah. He is all of that as the son of David, of Israel. The son of Abraham, however, was he that came to fulfill all the promises to Abraham, the largest of which that all nations through him would be blessed. Now here's where it's fascinating. If you've had a chance to hear any of the fall sermons, we noted in Matthew chapter 12 that Jesus is rejected as the son of David. And it's, it's as if what Matthew is saying is, if Jesus were to be rejected as the son of David, as the Messiah to Israel, which he is, it defaults back to or sort of unlocks the fact that he's a son of Abraham. He's a blessing to all nations. Now, it doesn't negate, he doesn't cease to be the son of David, but all the benefit and promise given to the son of Abraham is sort of unlocked by his rejection. We could spend the morning there, we won't. But it's a fascinating point uh, that Matthew makes. The big point this morning is God's grace. It's the grace of God. Again, that undeserved favor. And it's fair to say this morning, while we're looking at these four women, it's not just the women that highlight the grace of God. Jesus' ancestry, his lineage, is littered and filled with sinners, including the males. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He speaks to this paradox that God would use sinners to bring about his perfect Messiah and the means of his salvation. Paul says God chooses the foolish things to shame the wise, the weak things to shame the strong, the things that are lowly and despised and that are not to shame or to nullify those that are. Why? So that we can't boast. It's a God thing. It's his grace. It's the only way this is possible is by the grace of God. So Matthew's going to show us that Jesus has the right to rule on the throne of David. He's king. And yet, it's important that we always connect his birth to his cross. When Jesus later will go to the cross, he redeems, as Peter says, in one sacrifice for all time, for all people, he redeems you and I, but he even redeems his own ancestry, his own lineage, going all the way back. It's a fascinating point that Jesus' redemption of mankind is even his grandparents and great-grandparents and so on. Well, what about Matthew's four women? What about the four women of Jesus' genealogy? And a little bit of a, uh, an aside here, there's actually five, and Mary is the fifth woman. And Bob will expand on Mary when we get to our final week of Advent. So we're going to be building toward that as we consider these four women. Now, two disclaimers before we look at the women uh, specifically. Number one, that is the testimony of women, both at this time and in the biblical text in general. We read in, in the end of the Gospels, at the time that Jesus rose from the dead, that the women were the first ones to see Jesus, that they ran back to the disciples and testified to what they have seen, and the disciples didn't believe them. It's important to understand that the testimony of women was inadmissible in court. Depending on the part of the culture that you were in at this time, women didn't have any standing and were valued just a little bit above personal property. Not so true uh, in Jewish communities, but still, even in Jewish community, communities, inadmissible testimony. And yet Matthew is making a specific point to include not just four women, but four women who are not native Israelites, four women who don't deserve to be in Israel or in Jesus' lineage. And why is he doing that? Well, I think if we look at the full witness of Scripture, and even based on what we just looked at in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is what God does. And I think you can make a very strong case. In fact, I would argue that uh, as opposed to the Bible being anti-women or somehow overly patriarchal, the opposite is the case. Particularly as you look at the role of women in context of the culture and the time in which these books were written. The scriptures and God's teaching on women elevates the role of women. Now, yes, the New Testament teaches that there is di are different roles for men and different roles for women within the home and within the church. 
But this is countercultural to the time. The gospel's highlighting the fact that the women were the ones that carried the testimony of seeing Jesus risen again is countercultural to the time. And that sort of brings us into our next point, disclaimer number two. And this really comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor during the Nazi, uh, Nazi time in, in Germany. And he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, where he blows up this idea of cheap grace. And that is that, well, if I, just, if I just receive God's forgiveness, I can do whatever I want. I can live however I want to live. There needs to be no response. It's, it's where the, the doctrines related to universalism grow up. That is not what's happening here. We're going to highlight the grace of God here this morning. But each of these women, if you go back and you read the entire account of their lives, shows a demonstrable uh, action of both marrying obedience to faith and trust in God Almighty. In each of their lives, there is a demonstration of response to Yahweh in their lives. We're not spending much time on it this morning because we're about the grace of God. It's our theme for the morning. But I want you to know that it's not cheap grace, that they do respond. So let's look at these women in a little bit more detail. We begin with Tamar. Tamar is a fascinating story that reads like a Jerry Springer script. Tamar is a Canaanite woman whom Judah, one of the 12 patriarchs, 12 sons of Jacob, goes and gets for his son Ur. He takes a woman from the Canaanites, gives her to his son. His son displeases the Lord and the Lord strikes him dead. His brother is supposed to, according to the Levirate marriage law of the time, now give his wife children. He does not, and God judges him, and he is struck dead. There's a third son, Shelah, and Judah, I think, basically says to himself, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, I'm not losing all three of my sons to this woman, and he refuses to give her, to, to give him to Tamar. And so what does Tamar do? She takes matters into her own hands. She dresses as a prostitute. She goes to the town where Judah is headed, probably to do some business, And she basically uh, gets in his way, propositions herself. They end up in this relationship, and she becomes pregnant. And that's where we pick it up here in Genesis chapter 38. It says, about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant, Judah said. Bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila. And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread, tied it on his wrist, and said, This one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out, and she said, so this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. Now, you thought I was kidding about the Jerry Springer thing. It's really, it's it's a mess. It's a mess. I mean, she is not commended for her actions. She's deceitful. She's duplicitous. She blackmails. He... Obviously, she knew that there was some element of of his own sin. She knew a little bit about him. And by the way, this is the first place in which Judah, as a man, is repentant in the Scriptures. Up to this point, he's a very hard man. He's the one who wants to sell his brother Joseph. He reacts flippantly here and says, I'll just burn her to his daughter-in-law. But when she calls him out, despite the fact she's got her own sin going on here, this is the first time he is repentant. And so God gives her this son through this crazy relationship, and his name is Perez. Now, real quick on names. When we name our children nowadays, if you have children or you have nieces or nephews, we typically name our children perhaps uh, uh, according to a family name that we're being passed down, or in my case, I named my son after me, after my father, or you know, nowadays it's even common to just throw some conjunctions and some vowels together and just call it what you will. That is not the case in this time, and in particular for the people of God. 
oftentimes God actually declared over the child what the child would be na- to be named. But in either case, these children were named as both a pronouncement over those to whom they came from and the hope of the future that they would bring. There is intent in the name. And so we're very simply going to, this morning going to look at the position of each woman the son that they are given as an heir as we're looking at a genealogy and what that name would have pronounced over her in particular. So Tamar finds herself, she's essentially no longer a Canaanite. She's been yanked out of that life, but she's also not an Israelite. Her husband is gone. She has no heir. Positionally, she is stuck. She's got no latitude. She can't go in any direction. Granted, she wrongfully takes matters into her own hands. But God, in his grace, undeserved, gives her a son named Perez. And Perez means a breach. It means breaking out or to break free. And God, in his grace, redeems Tamar's life in the name, seen in the name of her son. And in him, in his grace, she breaks free. She becomes an ancestor of the Messiah. She has all that she was missing. She's now a part of the family of God, even to the point of the Messiah that we read about in Matthew chapter 1. Very simply this morning, from what is it that you need to break free? God is a God of grace who breaks us free. Maybe it's a sinful pattern, habit, action, attitude. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's a difficult family scenario. What is it from which you need to break free? Secondly, are we a church that helps people break free? I think to some degree we are. Some of the ministries that you can get involved in here, I think that that that's, that is the case, but there's more that we need to do. We need to be in the business of helping people know the God of grace who will help them to break free. Well, we come to Rahab. In Rahab, we read of her in Joshua chapter 6, and it says, Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. In James, the epistle of James in the New Testament, he says, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? See, Rahab is a member of this city-state that is marked for destruction by the Israelites. She's a Jerichoite. And she risks everything she has and lays it on the line and is in a complete place of vulnerability. If she is caught with the bargain she's made with the spies, she'll be wiped out, her and her, her, her entire family. If she doesn't do what she's covenanted to do, she'll be wiped out, her and her entire family, by the Israelites. She is in a place of complete weakness and vulnerability. In addition, she's a prostitute. Now again, I really think that we we romanticize and sanitize the Bible. James makes it clear. He says, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous? He contrasts her lifestyle, her vocation, with the righteousness that is given to her by God in his grace. And so Rahab, This prostitute and this foreigner who risks everything has Boaz. Now, technical note, this is where one of these genealogy points becomes apparent. This Boaz is not the direct son of Rahab, but is probably the great, great, great grandson. But in terms of Matthew's genealogy, again, it's intentional because the name Boaz means to have strength or to be strong in him, that is in God. And Rahab is redeemed. God, in his grace, redeems her life, seen in the name of her offspring, and in his grace, she finds strength. She's in a position of complete weakness, and in God, she finds strength, and she becomes an ancestor of the Messiah. Where do you need his strength today? Where is it that you feel marginalized, where you feel in a place of complete vulnerability, Where do you need to know the God of grace who gives you his strength today? Further, are we a church and a community where outsiders, foreigners, if you will, find strength? Or are we just a community that exists for ourselves? Hard and important questions. And that brings us to Ruth. Ruth, chapter 1. 
verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Later in the last chapter, Boaz says, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, and so on. Over and over and over again, she is called Ruth the Moabitess. The author of the book of Ruth wants to make it very clear she is not an Israelite. In fact, Moab was an enemy of Israel. Moab, you may remember, the man Moab was the offspring of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his oldest daughter. And his people go on to be an enemy of Israel. They actually try to curse Israel. This is Ruth's people. And so Ruth comes to Israel under somewhat the covering of Naomi. And what does she end up? The only option for her, the only option is to be the lowest of servants, gleaning in the fields, picking up the scraps of the harvest. And Ruth documents very clearly that the women who were the servants on this lowest level were subject to harassment, assault, and even rape. She was at great risk in this lowly place as an enemy of God, a foreigner, and a servant. And if you know the story of Ruth, it's this beautiful wedding story. of God brings Boaz into her life, and Israel's enemy, this woman, this Moabitess, this foreigner, this outcast, is given a son named Obed. And Obed means servant of the Lord. And God, in his grace, redeems Ruth's life, seen in the naming of her son, And in his grace, she becomes a servant of the king and an ancestor of the Messiah. And we could see in each one of these women the working of God's grace in the details and behind the scenes. I want to ask each one of us today, how can God's grace realign who we are serving? We're all serving something or someone or some entity. How can God's grace in my life help me to realign where and what and who I'm serving. And consequently, are we a church that serves the king and that exhorts others to serve? Or are we just a community of consumers who come to be entertained, come to have a a worship experience? Or are we serving the king? We're servants of the king. And that brings us to the final of the four women Well, sort of. I've alluded to the fact that there are actually five. But in 2 Samuel 11, we read of Bathsheba. It says, In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness and then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. She loses this child as God judges David and Bathsheba. But much later, David comes to her again in 2 Samuel 12, it says, And David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. Now Bathsheba, who is an Israelite, is by her marriage to Uriah the Hittite also an outsider. And we don't know, the scripture is a little bit ambiguous as to, is Bathsheba complicit in this arrangement? Is she enamored with the idea of being called into the king's bedchamber? Or is it simply she's repulsed by it and she's just power played? Because of everything we've already said about women at the time, she has no, no position to contest, to contest it. Not really sure. I think you can make a case either way. But what is clear is that this woman is used. She loses her husband. She loses this child that she was probably relatively confused about how it was conceived. She's power played by a king, whether she was complicit or not. And she had to be in a position where she felt utterly used. And yet, as we make our application here this morning, and and Johnny's going to come out and lead us in a final song uh, in just a moment. As we make our final application this morning, There's a double meaning 
for the child born to David and Bathsheba. Solomon is a variant on the word shalom and means peace. But Nathan comes to David and Bathsheba and says, I want you to change his name to Jedidiah. Now, for whatever reason, I don't know the answer to this question. Maybe you do. Jedidiah doesn't stick in the rest of the Bible. He's always known as Solomon. But Jedidiah means this. It means loved by the Lord, loved by God. And God in his grace redeems Bathsheba's life seen in the name of her son. In his grace, she is loved by God. I wonder this morning, do you know that you are loved by God Almighty? Do you know that he loved you enough to send his son to die for you? You are loved by God, and Bathsheba becomes an ancestor of the Messiah. Again, as a church, are we a church that is known by the love of God? Is the love of God evident in our interactions within and without these walls? Great questions to ponder. But you know, something's missing. If you think about these names strung together, that God in his grace breaks us free, that he provides strength that we can't find in any other source, that we become servants of the king and gain purpose and meaning, and that we are loved by God Almighty. The vehicle of that, which ties it all together, is missing. It sounds like it's of human effort still. But there's another woman And we won't look at her in detail, but she has a son. And she has a son named Jesus. And Jesus means the Lord saves. It's in Christ. It's in Jesus that all of the imagery of this and the application of it ties together. Matthew is dropping these hints to us in this genealogy. He's highlighting the grace of God, and he's saying there's something special coming through a woman that's going to tie all of this together. And these four, essentially foreign women, three of whom who are mixed up in this sexual sin and all this stuff, God in his grace delivers through them all the way down to Jesus the Messiah, Jesus, the Lord who saves. It is the Lord himself who breaks us free, gives us strength, strength, allows us to become servants of the king and reminds us that we are loved by almighty God. I wonder in your life this morning, do you know Jesus who saves? That's where all this is driving toward. So this morning as we get ready to close, I'm going to ask you to uh, stand this morning. Let's praise him that in his grace, we stand. This anchor. This anchor for my soul. This everlasting hope. Your grace on which I stand. It's where my life begins, my future held within, your grace on which I stand. And oh, this grace on which I stand, it will hold me to the end, never failing. Jesus, you will ever be my salvation. And when I'm on the run, the road that leads me home, your grace on which I stand. And when I see your face, the only claim I'll make, your grace on which I stand. And oh, this grace on which I stand, it will hold me till the end, never failing. And oh, praise the one who rescued me, Jesus, you will ever be my salvation. Sing that out. And oh, this grace on which I stand, it will hold me till the end, 
never failing and oh praise the one who rescued me Jesus you will ever be my salvation let's pray our God and Father we are marveled by the way that you brought this, this uh, child, your son, into the world. Lord, that you used the likes of these women and the men as well, Lord. God, it's a reminder that you even use us. Lord, would you forgive us when we see the culture and, and society around us and just judge, as opposed to praying that you might raise up a Tamar, a Rahab, a Ruth, or a Bathsheba out of the women who have so much sway in our society today. Lord, that you might do the same in the men in, in our society. Lord, we pray this way for not just pop culture, but for the governments of our world, for our neighbors, for uh, all these, these folks that, that uh, we might be quick to judge. Lord, would you help us be reminded this morning that these women represent us, that we don't have any standing before you, and yet you've called us by your grace into your family. You've given us a place to serve. You've given us a hope for the future all because this baby came destined for a cross. God, we're swirling and mixed with the thoughts of, of your grace and our sin and how you, how you accomplished all this. More than all that, Lord, we just want to worship you and tell you that we love you. We pray in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this first Sunday of Advent. We encourage you, if you're new, to swing by the Welcome Center back through the double doors. And have a great Sunday.